I always called this the amateur radio kit roundup. So that's the end of the presentation portion. Neil Goldstein, uh, W2NDG, will take us on a tour tonight uh, in terms of, and offer some hints and tips and tricks and things that we need to know. I mean, if you were like me, you built a heat kit, uh, you know, sort of code oscillator when you were a kid and you'd sort of toyed around with things uh, and got good at some things and not so good at others. And, and obviously, but there's a lot of kit building that's still going on. Okay, and he'll walk you through that tonight and obviously some of the things that uh, will make your hobby a little bit more enhanced by being able to do kit building. Neil has been tinkering around with radio since the early 70s when he hung out in his uncle's ham shack up in Connecticut. And he was W1 PBC now is silent, uh, sadly. Okay. These days he can be found in the Hudson Valley in Catskill Mountains with a QRP radio uh, or sitting at a workbench amidst, amid a cloud of solder smoke, but not tonight. He's speaking to us. After first getting licensed in 2011 as KD2 APZ, he started looking for ways to merge his two hobbies, which were computers and radio. He's an extra class license holder and he experiments with SDR, rig controls, digital modes, uh, and has a well used by his own self description soldering iron. He's been an SWL most of his life. Neil, we have a, we have a monitoring group here as part of the club too, and you're welcome to join us. Okay, um, and his better half KD2CHE is also a ham. I hope you're listening in. So anyway, Neil is active in OMAR, uh, the QSY Society Clubs, and he's written for amateurradio.com, as well as the Spectrum Monitor, Monitor and frequently presents at clubs meetings and on various computer related subjects. He maintains uh, a, a website, radiokitguide.com. That's radiokitguide.com, which is the complete list of radio kit sources for the, on the internet. So anyway, Neil, let me, without further ado, let me turn the program over to you. Uh, and again, what, and just in terms of protocol for our sessions, what we're going to do is we're gonna let Neil walk through his entire presentation and then we'll take Q and A. So it basically uh, keeps Neil on track and keeps Tom uh, in terms of videoing and editing on track as well. So if you can just do that as a courtesy, let's hold all Q&A until the end of the program. So with that, no further ado here, it's over to you, Neil, uh, W2NDG. All right, and thank you. And I'm uh, up in, oh, I'm in Highland, New York. I'm uh, almost literally a stone's throw from what's called New Paltz, New York, um, right at the Shuangog Mountains. We moved up here back in the fall. I was living on Long Island for about a decade, but this is home for me. I grew up at Woodstock. So, uh, but I was not a ham when I lived up here before. So that all came while we were living on Long Island. I'm still a member of some of the clubs from down there, but up here I'm active in OMARC, which is the Overlook Mountain Amateur Radio Club. Um, and we have our repeater up at about 2,800 feet here. Pretty active club because of that. I'm also active in LICW. Um, I'm sure one or more of you may be members of that. It's a great group and changing the way that we uh, teach and perpetuate the use of CW. Normally, I'm taking a break for the summer, but I teach a class for them every Wednesday night called uh, CW Makers. It's not necessarily building CW things, but uh, building in general. And um, I do that class usually from my workshop downstairs here and show off things that I've built and then run through the build in pictures and take questions and try to support people who are trying to build on their own. Those classes will start up again on September 22nd, uh, taking a break until then. But definitely a great group. Let me start my presentation here. I've always called this the Amateur Radio Kit Roundup. This has been um, modified over the years couple of times, I try to keep it up to date. The kit guide itself, which we'll touch on, um, was also recently updated just for purposes of updating the presentation as well. So why do we build? We build because it's fun. It's satisfying. And it's satisfying because the, the, the end result is under your control. Using something that you made with your own hands, that I think in any hobby is just wonderful. There's a certain amount of legacy to this. Hams started with homebrew. In the beginning, when my uncle, who was mentioned in uh, my bio there, uh, when he started out towards the end of the depression, there, there wasn't a lot of commercial ham radio gear. Uh, these guys built their own radios. And my mother remembers that when she was a little girl, Uncle Wynn had a little table in the corner of their living room in their apartment in Queens where he had a radio. And she doesn't really know anything more about it. She uh, never really had any kind of tutoring in it. 
but she remembers that he had that radio. So a little history. I'm an IT professional. I've been in that business for about 25 years and a licensed ham since 2011. I started with shortwave radios at the age of seven when somebody gave me one and uh, just had the bug for that and electronics. I was building Radio Shack kits through the 70s, um, starting, of course, with those spring terminal kits that we all had and then uh, attempting to solder, finally actually making it work. Around 2012, I returned to kit building as a ham, and I discovered when I went on the internet looking for lists of things to do that there were no accurate or up-to-date lists of kits. So that's where radiokitguide.com was born. I created my own. So there's a picture of a kit that I built in the 70s. Obviously not the same one that I built, but, and this picture comes from an interesting source. There will be, and I've already posted it. There's a link at the end of the presentation, but on my blog, I have a little post for you folks, which has links, useful links from the presentation. This is from the P-Box history page. There is a guy who has put up a history of all of the Radio Shock Jack P-Box kits and I believe the manuals where he has them. So um, what's cool is you can build these from schematics. Just get a perf board and make your own. Some of these were pretty cool. So just some random early kit examples. The night kit transmitter was, was one of the most popular inexpensive ham radio kits of your. The Globe Patrol, I built one of these. This is probably one of the last things I built before I lost interest. A couple of my early soldering attempts didn't work. This one worked though. I don't know whatever happened to it. I assume it went in one of mom's yard sales. DX60B, I did not build one of these, but I did own one from the original builder. So we can talk about types of construction when we're building. This is a picture of through hole soldering, which is exactly what, what it says it is. This is for a long time what 90% of our construction was for a couple of, you know, a few decades now. Surface mount. So we're getting into this more and more now. A lot of people are still apprehensive about it. I have turned out some really good surface mount work and I don't have the steadiest hands in the world. A lot of people say that, you know, they don't have really steady hands. Um, if you can steady your hands while you're guiding them, what you really need to do this correctly is magnification. I'll tell you, get a good set of magnifiers and we'll talk about that coming up. But 0805 size components are very common in surface mount by hand work. I've gone down to 0603 with success and built. I probably won't go much lower than that, but you can build surface mount. There's several different methods and techniques. Manhattan construction with knee pads. So Manhattan construction is, there's a few different methods of doing it. You can take a copper clad board and actually machine out little islands in it. But the easiest way to do it is to buy knee pads from Rex, from uh, qrpme.com. And there are these little squares that you see here. And then he also has me pads, which is one for this IC here. And these are the little me squares. And he has different ones for different components. And you glue these down with crazy glue onto your copper board. And what's cool is you can basically build out uh, in the same shape as your schematic. So in most cases, and they work well. Manhattan dead bug. Why do we call it dead bug? Because that's what it looks like. You take the ICs, you glue them upside down and you tie off of them and they look like little dead bugs sticking their legs up in the air. It's a messy way of working, but if you look at a lot of the prototype work done by people over the years and some, some famous kits that are out there like uh, Ashar Farhan's uh, Bidex work, some of his early prototypes are done this way. And they look horrible. And sometimes it's called ugly construction as well. But it works. This is just breadboard, very old method, quick prototyping. Also kind of messy if you look at the bottom of it, solderless breadboard. I did a whole class on this at LICW, talking about you know which pins are connected and which are insulated from each other. Two neat things about this method. One is that there's now, um, I know at least one company, probably more than one, that are making solderless breadboards with embedded Arduinos. Really cool. Kind of makes things a little easy if you're building some microcontroller project. Also, you can buy regular copper solder versions of these boards. So once you prototype something on your solderless breadboard, if you want a quick permanent version of it, 
you can buy a solder version of one of these solderless breadboards and just transfer everything over. I think this is the other one I was just mentioning. Yes. So this is a relatively new method of construction marketed by the four state QRP group. It's called Pittsburgh construction uh, because the inventor I believe is from Pittsburgh. It's kind of like a cross between through hole and surface mount. Also kind of like the me pads in some ways, but they create a board that has these little islands. They're multi-layer boards. So the circuitry is embedded in the board. And what's neat about these is that the other side of the board is usually the front panel of the device that you're building. So it's already labeled decal. This particular one here is the Ozark Patrol Regenerative Shortwave Receiver. And when you view it from the front, it has all of the knobs and switches and everything on the other side of this. Really nice. Let's talk about tools for a moment. Got to have a meter. This is a Harbor Freight meter, not their uh, freebie one, <laughs> which some of us uh, had more than one of those laying in a drawer. But this is actually a decent meter. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not a fluke. It's it's not a you know professional bench meter, but it does the job for me. And if I blow it up, I'm not sad. I do have a nice fluke bench meter I picked up at a yard sale, and that also sits there. But this thing. Um, gets quite a bit of use from it from me. One of the things I'm frequently doing with it is checking resistors. And you're saying, oh, he's checking them for tolerance. Yes, and I'm colorblind. So I have to uh, double check my eyes because I don't always trust them. Not completely colorblind, but enough that I really need to uh, double check everything. I recently started using the uh, capacitance portion of this meter and it does seem to work, which kind of surprised me because usually they're not so accurate. A good set of pliers, I mean, the two basic ones that you always need are the diagonal cutters and a good needle nose, but any others you can buy usually like this, a six pack of assorted pliers from Amazon or somewhere else. Alligator clips, can never have enough of these. Used to be a great Radio Shack item. Harbor Freight has them in the little uh, electrical section that they have. There's a basic like generic soldering station. This is a copy of, so this is a copy of one of the, the popular Weller ones. This particular one I bought from uh, Quicksilver at one of the ham fests. This, uh, there's a link to where to find these in uh, that post that I mentioned, but this is actually a dental instrument. It's a 317 pliers, also called a cotton pliers or a college pliers. It's an angled tweezers. Just really handy shape, really works well for picking things up out of little parts bins or fishing parts out of a, a, a busy board that you drop stuff into. They also make a locking version of this. There, sophisticated tool that we all need, the egg carton. Great for sorting stuff. The pressed paper ones are fine, but the foam ones are better if you wanna stand your resistors and caps up in a row because it's easier to push through. You'll find when you're trying to push the resistors through these paper ones that you just bend the leads. You can do it, just keep, a uh, you know, keep a couple of sewing pins around so you can make a hole first. Cookie sheet. Yes, we don't want to ruin the dining room table. And these, I bought uh, like 20 of them for a build-a-thon at Dollar Tree. Now, they, they, and of course, they cost a dollar a piece. But yeah, cheap cookie sheets. I have something new I'm using instead of cookie sheets now, though. We'll get to that. This is the Tiny SA Spectrum Analyzer. Really great tool. I mean, it's it's a cheap spectrum analyzer. It's not going to outperform a five thousand dollars spectrum analyzer, but it is quite impressive for the uh, you know seventy or eighty dollars you're going to spend on it. Definitely worth it. I use it because you can use it on the receive side to make sure that the kit you built is actually transmitting where it's supposed to be, and you can use it as a small signal generator to make sure you're receiving signals. It'll generate in different modes as well, which is cool. There's a link on the, the web page, by the way, for the tiny essay of where to buy the official version. Like so many of these Chinese products, there are cheapy knockoff versions that you want to avoid. Uh, this thing that just came up, this is the hot holder. This is a block of high heat silicone. Uh, yes, you could probably 3D print this, but not in the high heat version. And you can buy these from Radio Shack. Radio Shack is still alive. They're selling online and these this ad came up uh, one day on Facebook. And I think they cost about $40, which seems kind of pricey, but I think it was well worth it. 
It's a, like a big block of rubber and you can stick connectors and such into it. It even has two little wire holders so you can position two wires so they crisscross for soldering, just really handy. I think it's really more designed for professional audio stuff. It has like XLR connector holders, but there's enough useful sizes in this that you will find it useful on your workbench. This is my current soldering station. You'll see these on Amazon. This one came from eBay. They're ridiculously inexpensive for what they look like. I've heard that people have gotten bad ones. I don't know, the one that I got has been perfect. I've been using it for more than a year, it works great. It has uh, a good soldering iron that takes all the standard tips. It has a rework nozzle, a little you know hot air gun, and it also has a little bench voltmeter and a little bench power supply. Neat little thing. It's not that little, but there's also a link to the one that I bought on the web page. I put up another thing of pliers here because this looks like a box full of pliers that I bought at a yard sale. And I'll just mention, if you do get around to yard sales where you are, always look at the tool tables. There's always interesting stuff there. And sometimes you'll see people throwing away a whole bunch of old pliers because the insulation came off of the grips or whatever. Uh, you get some good stuff at yard sales as well. This is almost the same magnifier that I wear on my head when I'm working. These are usually three stage magnifiers. I don't have a link to this because they're so easy to find. They're all over the place. Amazon has them. And when I say three stage, when you put it on your head, there's a set of lenses here, rectangular. There's a second set that flip down from the inside over them that give you twice the magnification. Then you have the monocle that flips down in place for super magnification. I have these and I have a set of the cheap uh, plastic uh, monocles uh, that like a jewelry shop would have. Well, theirs are probably better than my cheap plastic ones. And I think those came from Harbor Freight, but you get a little LED light on this thing. This is a lifesaver for me. This is the newest addition to the workbench. This is a big silicone mat. It shows you the rough size here about uh, 14 by 21 and a half. Some of these little compartments here are magnetic. It has this, see this matrix here? This is when you take screws out of something like a laptop so you can lay them out in the pattern that you took them out in, <laughs> which is really handy. But it's also, once again, high heat. So if you drip solder on this thing, it's not gonna catch fire. So that's the run through of the tools. So what should we be building? Let's look at some beginner stuff, the Pixie. There's so many versions of the, of the Pixie, but a number of years ago, Chinese Pixies started showing up on eBay, AliExpress, banggood.com, all these sites. You can get these things as low as three bucks each. They're cheap and built to stay that way. The components are not always the best tolerances, but it's a good quick build. My take on the Pixie is they're fun to put together really quick. It's a real challenge to get a contact on one of these. It's a good beginner's project for somebody who's beginning at soldering. It is a terrible beginner's radio for a new ham <laughs> because of their broad receiver and super low power, especially with the quality of some of the components and these really cheesy ones. You're not going to, you know, make a new ham happy trying to make contacts on one of these. They will receive though the 40 meter one with a decent antenna at night, you'll hear signals. So at least they know it's working, but they're pretty easy. It's kind of hard to mess these up. This is uh, the little squall from QRP me. It's based on the Pixie, but with better components and some improvements to the circuit. And it has band modules. So you can build it for multiple bands. Neat little thing from Rex. If you're not familiar with uh, Rex Harper's company, QRP me, He's the tuna can guy, and you can see that this is sitting on top of what looks like a tuna can. His kits come packaged in a tuna fish can, and you open it up, take everything out, and build the kit. So he has uh, quite the sense of humor. Interesting guy. This is the Splinter 2. This is a little pricier than the other ones, but it's a neat kit. It's actually a separate transmitter and receiver on one board. He gives you this wooden base for it and the decals and uh, encourages you to paint or finish the base in your choice of colors and then send him a picture when you're done. But it's a neat little radio. And it was written up, I believe, in QST at some point. Intermediate. I've put the QCX Plus on the intermediate list because it's a large board and the components are spaced out pretty far. It's a lot of components, but it's pretty straightforward. It does have some toroid winding. Don't be afraid of toroid winding. There's so much help online about it. You really, you know, 
something you can learn about. We've uh, covered it a couple of times in my LIC, LICW classes, but uh, I think I'm probably gonna make a general YouTube video for it at some point on my YouTube channel. I have a few little tricks, but everybody has these crazy tools and methods they use. Mine's just all about not losing count. And if you do, use the magnifiers. So Hans hit some crazy milestone. I think it was last week. I forget how many of these things he sold. Some insane number. Not this particular model, but all of the QCXs combined. Great radio though. Incredible amount of features for the money. This is the Rockmite 2, also from Rex Harper, QRP me. This is based on a Small Wonder Labs K1SWL radio. Uh, Small Wonder Labs shut down. Dave Benson retired, but he's still designing radios for other companies, but he doesn't run his own company anymore. A couple other people picked up his projects. This was one of them. Rex picked up the Rockmite 2. You'll see something called a Rockmite on eBay and from AliExpress. It's a completely different animal. It's uh, not the same radio. It doesn't And like the uh, Pixies, you read some of the reviews of people who have built some of these Chinese Rockmites, definitely not the same radio, but there's interesting versions of it. The funniest one, if you understand the irony here, is that there is a new synthesizer controlled Rockmite the digital readout. Now it's no longer a rock mite because the whole point of rock was that it was a rock bound radio. So now they have a uh, digitally tuned rock mite they're selling on uh, eBay and AliExpress. So, kind of funny. Incidentally, some of the other names of these kits you'll see on those sites, uh, I don't know where the translations broke down, but there's one called Frog Sounds. There's a, a really odd spelling and take on the 49er kit. And there's another one, I can't remember the name of. They're all kind of funny. Advanced, this is another QCX, but this is the mini. And the reason why this is on the advanced list is because even though there are less components to install than the plus, because all of the surface mount work is done in this tiny kit, it is so small and everything is so close together that this really is an advanced kit and also and I have uh, done a couple of videos and presentations on this particular radio. Read the manual beginning to end before you start to build it. I, and I'd stress that. They always tell us to do that, and most of us don't. There's a real reason for this one. And it is because you want to have it kind of familiar in your head. And as you're going through this build, do not skip anything. Read every word in Hans's excellent manual. It's a great manual, and there's a reason why he tells you to do some things. You might say, I don't need to do that. It doesn't matter what you think. Do what he tells you to do, because if you don't, it won't assemble like this. It has the closest mechanical tolerances I've seen, and it just, I, I am so impressed with Hans, not just as a ham or an electronics guy, but just as a mechanical engineer. This is just such an incredible mechanical design that he managed to figure out how to make this radio this small and figure out how to get it to go together like this. And I mean, there's plenty of spots during this build where, where if you are, you know, a quarter of a millimeter off, something's not going to go together right. Read, 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 read. This is a little different one. There's a, uh, a Spanish ham, EA3GCY. His company and his choices of products have been evolving. He has a lot of stuff to work with now. This is the DB4020. This is a dual band uh, sideband transceiver as it comes, but you can add a CW interface kit for it optionally. Uh, he's got a bunch of kits now. Now I haven't built any of this stuff yet, but I think that'll be next up on the list at some point. Long build, expert. I had more than one kit on here at one point. There's not a lot left here, but the K2. What a great radio, still offered. I'm kind of disappointed in Elecraft these days that they've discontinued some of their more simple radios and some of the kits, you know, in favor of vaporware. <laughs> I guess, I don't know, are they actually shipping K4s now? But I, you know, I, I do appreciate their radios. I'm not, you know, I would never badmouth their engineering or their radios, for sure. They are fantastic rigs. I'd love to have a KX3 or a KX2, but I think they've abandoned their roots a little bit, which disappoints me. This is still a project. This is something that if you have the time and the means and the uh, expertise and the patience to do one of these builds, 
you will be very happy with the results. Everybody I've ever talked to who built one of these loves that radio. This is the one I don't know the current status of. It uh, seems like it's in a holding pattern. DZ Kits has always had some version of the Sienna available. It looks like it's still listed as coming soon right now. They completely changed and updated it, but keep an eye on the website. Pretty advanced rig. Uh, costs quite a bit more than a K2. Uh, you're basically building a professional radio here. You can look at some of the companies. I'll run through these somewhat quickly, but four state QRP. This is interesting new kit that they claim is uh, limited. They're not going to have them very long. This is a um, 30 meter CW kit that's all surface mount. I have one of these in my things to build pile. I usually buy anything that this comp or this club comes out with. This is the Cricket. This is the 30 meter version of the Cricket. Four State sells, I think, one version of it currently, and the original designer sells them uh, NM0S through eBay. He has uh, some of the older retired ones on his eBay site. The Nouveau 75. This is an AM 75 meter transceiver that comes with the housing that you see here, which is nice. Some of the new kits from this group and a couple others are uh, coming with cases that are made out of uh, PC board material. Really nice stuff. The Hilltopper 40, also with a nice case. AliExpress, we started talking about these briefly. Here's the Pixie. I think I bought a five pack of these for like $14.99 one time on eBay. <laughs> Ended up uh, using a couple of the components when I needed some stuff. One of the things to note here though, if you're gonna build any of these Chinese kits from AliExpress or eBay, they usually, they're usually 40 meters and they come with a crystal for 7.023, which uh, is fine if you're an extra, but you're gonna to have to replace that crystal with something else if you're not. This is another one of them. And I think this might be the Frogs Calling kit. This is either the Frogs Calling or the 49er. And there's one of the versions of the Rock Might. This is the serial port version. This one you can actually hook up to your computer through a serial port and program the, uh, the keyer. There is also, uh, for the 49er, you'll see a Wi-Fi version that comes up, and that's the same idea. It's just for programming the keyer. Uh, they give you an Android app for doing it, which uh, your phone will flag as malware. <laughs> I don't know if it really is, but I usually don't use an active Android phone for doing stuff like that. I always have an old one laying around on my desk here. This is a little tuner project that shows up on AliExpress all the time. It looks so refined here. It's, it's uh, they give you a pretty much plain plastic box. You gotta drill the holes in. It's a little bit of work. Pacific Antenna, qrpkits.com, formerly Hendrix QRP. Doug Hendrix sold this company to Pacific Antenna. The Bin X20 is probably no longer going to be available, but it's still on the website as coming soon. Maybe they'll come up with a different version of it, but it's impossible to compete with Ashar's own uh, bid X at the price that they were selling it at. It's the Fort Tuthill 15, the PFR 3, which is uh, another Steve Weber design. This is their old regenerative receiver, KD1 JV Survivor. This is a uh, 75 meter sideband and CW transceiver. Pretty economical price wise, too. Not too hard to build. This is one of the favorites, and uh, I have a few friends that have the, this particular radio, the uh, KD1JV tri-band. Uh, this is also a Steve Weber design. You get to pick the three bands. It's a CW radio, pretty popular. Here's our Spanish ham, a 3 gcy QRPHamRadioKits.com now. We finally got a name and a URL. And there's some different ones here. So we have uh, the Eiler, which is his original sideband radio. You can add a um, synthesizer and display to it. This one is the MFT, which is a very simple build, and it's basically a separate receiver and transmitter on a board. This is one of these double sideband radios. So it's, it's phone, but it's double sideband. So it's putting out both upper and lower at the same time. It does this because it's a much simpler build than building a sideband kit much easier design as well. And that's perfectly legal to do this. You'll see every now and then somebody putting out one of these signals, but they're QRP radios, so you're not gonna get a whole lot of people hearing you, but I'm sure because of the nature of 40 meters uh, that somebody will complain to you. 
but uh, there's nothing wrong with it. This is another one of the rings, the EGB Plus. I think this is his uh, dual band or possibly tri band, I forget, CW rig, and the DB4020, which I already mentioned. MFJ and Vectronics still sell a bunch of kit versions of some of their products. Vectronics will carry like a kit version of one of the MFJs. There's the Cub transceiver been in their line for years. 8100 regenerative radio and Vectronics and MFJ both sell versions of this. There's the Vectronics one. You can see it's the same radio. And there's one of the Vectronics transceivers. QRP me, Rex Harper. There's the rock mite, which we touched on earlier. And a little squall. Here's some others. This is the sudden storm receiver, also buildable for different bands. Advanced two here. Hold on. Here's the Super Tuna 2 transmitter. Once again, the band modules and another version, the two tinned tunas, easy build. A lot of these are based on the old NorCal tuna can transmitter project. Different versions, different modifications on it. Got some accessories that Rex sells. There's your uh, knee squares for Manhattan construction, knee pads, tube knee pads. For those of you who like to build hollow state, there's a block toids. This is a, like a me pads board that fits into an Altoids tin. Great idea. And there's just a, an Altoids breadboard that he sells. Tony Parks 5 Dash. I don't know the full status of Tony Parks kits right now. A lot of them are still available, not as many as you see here, but he's still selling quite a few. A couple of years ago, and this is the reason why I say I'm not sure, Tony made an announcement on one of the uh, the Yahoo group at the time, or the Groups IO group now, that he was retiring and wouldn't be selling kits anymore. But that never happened. He was still selling them. So I know a couple things disappeared, but you can still buy um, one of the more popular things to build here, the Softrock RXTX Ensemble Transceiver Kit where you can order this for two or three bands. Yeah, there are a couple of sol uh, surface mount components on it, but they're not too hard. And what you get is a uh, roughly one watt SDR transceiver. Uh, it'll work on two or three bands, depending on what bands you pick it for. Definitely a neat project. There's a close up of the RXTX Ensemble. Walford. This is another one that uh, those of you who do a little bit of building or know a little bit about the business may not have heard of this guy. He's from Great Britain and uh, his choices are constantly changing. So I recommend visiting the site regularly. And he puts out uh, a newsletter called Hot Iron that you can subscribe to. It comes via email and uh, it's, um, it's pretty technical at times, but also talks about some of the new projects. Here's just some of the ones that he has. And usually, like in this case, you can see Ivel plus Ilford. These are two different purchases if you want, or you can buy them together. It's a receiver, and then you can buy a transmitter that adds onto it, and it's controlled by the receiver's tuner. In this case, uh, I believe it's um, a VXO ham and the hail. This is a more advanced one. Queenie Kingston and Phaser. This is his newest project. Very simple regenerative receiver, the Bramwell, the Somer. This is a transceiver on one single board. With Walford, he splits all of his stuff up into categories, intermediate, beginners, and advanced. Uh, we saw breadboard radio before. There's, uh, he's come up with a lot of new stuff over the last couple of years. The Sawdust regenerative receiver, the Sawbuck receiver. I think this is more of a, a um, direct conversion receiver. This is the Woodpecker 60 transceiver. If you want to build something for 60 meters, not real common. The Splinter 2, which we mentioned before. And if you look here at the Splinter, which uh, I touched on very early in the beginner section, and it even comes with a little key mounted on the, on the board here, the wood chip transmitter. He refers to this as a universal transmitter. And the reason why he calls it that is, is if you have one of these old boat anchor receivers or even a nice uh, portable shortwave receiver laying around that you enjoy using, and he says, use it with this transmitter. Uh, he has it designed specifically to be used with uh, an outboard receiver. That was his, his vision when he designed this. QRP guys. It's a uh, one of the newer companies that's come up, their choices changed drastically during COVID because they had a bunch of things ready to go that they couldn't get components for. 
So uh, unfortunately, they discontinued some of their stuff before it even got released. This particular one you see here is a picture of the one that I built. This is uh, not a radio. Usually most of the stuff I show here is radios, but this is a combination power meter, SWR meter, and dummy load. Uh, I think it handles up to 10 watts. And yes, you're looking at the one that I built. That's mine. The Pacific Con, which will be out later this year at the Pacific Con convention. This is a, another double sideband phone rig, but also CW. This is one of his newest projects, or their newest projects. I say his because all three of these uh, radios were designed by Steve Weber, KD1JV. Steve's an amazing radio designer, and he puts out really good manuals like Hans does. This is a digital transceiver for any band from 160 through 10. It puts out five watts and it has a digital readout, digital synthesizer. It comes with three band modules and the parts to build it for the bands you see here, 20, 30, and 40. And then you can buy additional blank band modules and they give you the values. It's a really smart design. One of the things that Steve did with this radio is there's a resistor on each board that is detected by the microprocessor. And depending on what resistor it detects, that's the band it knows you plugged in. And it will set the microprocessor for the proper band and display the proper frequency. Cool stuff. Uh, they even tell you that the 12 and 10 meter modules are actually the same. But if you're you know, OCD about things like that, you can build both of them with the different resistors, or you can build one and just manually change the band, which you can also do. This synthesizer, by the way, is being used in other QRP guys' projects. It's something that Steve came up with. It's a very simple digital synth for all these radios. I have one of these ready to go. I want to build this really bad. That'll be the next thing that gets built. This is one of their antenna tuner projects. There's a whole bunch of these in their line. Just a nice antenna match tuner with uh, a setup where you can wind the uh, excess wire around the board when you're done. They have a whole bunch of these. This is the new tri-band that Steve designed. This is a 15, 12, and 10 meter CW transceiver. I think once again, about five watts, and you can build it as a VXO, or it'll take that same synthesizer that's on the digital radio. Once again, tri-band. This was done in advance of uh, the uh, upper bands opening up with the sunspots coming. So, and like I said, Steve's a great designer. Uh, I recently emailed him about supporting a 20 year old kit that I bought off of eBay unbuilt. That was his design. And when I got all the way to the end of it, I was missing a chip. And unfortunately it's the controller, uh, the pick and a shot in the dark. I emailed him. I said, I obviously don't expect you to support something that you did 20 years ago. Steve told me that he has the chips, he found the code, he just has to get the time to build a little carrier and uh, program the chip for me. And he said, uh, when I asked him about it, the last time I asked him about something else, because I do email him once in a while, um, he said to keep bugging him about the chip and he will send it. But he answers emails, uh, he answers questions. I'm not telling you to bombard him with emails. He uh, is a bit of a quiet guy and before anybody asks, he does not do presentations, <laughs> unfortunately. It's a shame because, uh, yeah, he is uh, a really fascinating guy. HF signals. Some of you will say, this isn't really a kit. No, it's kind of like a Lego set. You get the boards, you get the cables, you get the case, and snap, 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 you're done. <laughs> but it's still, for a lot of people, you know, um, time to get the soldering iron out because there's so many mods you can do to this radio. It's a bargain. In the low 200s, uh, you're getting an 80 through 10 CW and sideband transceiver. Great project. W. Rossi, this is a new one that came up. He sells these little radios. He calls the Half Pint on eBay. Midway, um, this guy has a little uh, storefront in Virginia. He picked up another one of the old uh, Dave Benson projects, K1 SWL. This is the SWL series of radios. And they were called um, the SW20, SW40, and so on. Midway calls them the ME20, ME40, ME30, whatever you buy. Uh, he's done a nice job updating them and sells a nice professional case for them, usually on eBay. But if you're ever cruising the I-81 corridor, 
look up where they are because he does have a storefront and you can actually go in there and meet the guy. Uh, Pentec, relatively new kit supplier. Pentec is selling this neat dual band radio and they have a tri-band one coming out. And one of the things they're stressing with this radio is knobs, not menus. Uh, bit of a throwback as far as how it works. Midnight Design Solutions. This was all the rage uh, when it came out. Uh, still very popular. This is the Phaser, another K1 SWL, Dave Benson project. Years and years ago, Dave sold uh, a PSK QRP radio called the PSK series through his SWL or Small Wonder Lab store. This is kind of an update on that. This is a modern synthesized digital mode radio. It comes where you can program it for an additional channel. So if you buy, let's say a 20 meter one, it'll come pre-programmed for FT8 on 20 meters. And then you can program the second frequency for another digital mode on the same band, like JSA call, or I think this will do PSK31. The SDR cube, there's a waiting list for these, but they are producing them. This is like a semi kit. It comes partially assembled. This is basically a standalone Tony Parks RXTX. It has an older version of the RXTX in it and its own processor, its own display. So you can have a standalone SDR based on the uh, Tony Parks design. Accessories referred to as anything that's not a radio. Um, and I do list companies on Radio Kit Guide that sell accessories, but I don't get into the individual listings. This is a interesting uh, converter that'll take a CB or AM radio and allow you to receive some of the ham bands on it. This is uh, the Clifford Wareham Easy Digi. These are uh, audio interface kits. There's another uh, accessory company, Fox Delta. This is one of theirs, the USB analyzer. This from MTech. This is the ZM2 tuner. This is probably one of the most popular manual QRP tuners ever made. These things are great. I have one. It comes uh, four different versions. They either come uh, BNC or SO239 and kit or assembled in both. Great little tuner. Here's another uh, sound card interface kit. This is the HF Signals and Tweno, made by the same guy who makes the uh, micro bit X. This is a little uh, test rig. It does some of the same things that the uh, Tiny SA does. This is the Hard Rock Power Amp. This will work with uh, an 817 or a KX or uh, any of the radios that you, you might build. Neat little multi-band 50 watt amp. A White Rock Mini Panels. These are cool from Electronics USA. More of a mechanical build. Here's just some websites. Dan's Electronics. Uh, his website looks uh, straight out of like 1991. It's just a list of components and he does have a few kits here and there, but his kits are basically a bag of parts and a schematic. Electronics USA, there's those little mini pedals. Kitsandparts.com. Guy's name is Diz. I assume it's a nickname. He's referred to frequently as the Toroid King. He sells the cores, the magnet wire, and he has all these this wonderful information on here for figuring out the math. Uh, so, you know, converting. If you're going from one core to another, how to adjust the windings. Different uh, gauge wire, how to adjust the windings. For a certain number of windings at a certain gauge wire, how many turns are you going to have to make? Things like that. Great site. Also components. And once in a while, some kits. Mini kits from Australia. I uh, did have a transceiver at one point. I don't think he does anymore. But lots of great little add-ons for your radios. Soda beams from England. I think it's Soda Beams that's making these little tiny audio filter boards that you can put inside of one of your projects. I do have uh, another web page that links from uh, Radio Kit Guide. It's up at the top of Radio Kit Guide that lists these web pages, sources, parts, surplus outlets, and more. And the ones I'm showing here, like All Electronics, Marlon P. Jones, Electronics Goldmine, there used to be so many of these companies, and a lot of them have gone away. I decided to make a list so we could make sure that we track the ones that are left. And a number of years ago, I got to go out to Silicon Valley with um, my wife, my brother and sister-in-law. And, you know, because we're nerds, you know, we didn't go to the beach. We did some of the touristy things, but we spent a few days 
wandering places like this that were out there and going to, you know, like the Google campus and getting a package picture of all the Android statues on the lawn and going to the defunct Yahoo campus and all sorts of things like that. But at the time, some of these companies were still in existence. And one of the ones we went to had a whole wall of used test equipment, just an amazing assortment. And right in the middle of it, they had a framed invoice, a handwritten bill for an oscilloscope sold to Steve Jobs when they were building the original Apple One in the garage. <laughs> Neat history. So that's the end of the presentation portion.